When I got married, it was like this. I was standing at the back of the church. I was a young, single guy. I owned my car. I had very little debt. No kids, no mortgage, none of those things. I walked up to the front of the church. The preacher said some of those magical church words. I was walking back down the aisle. I had two kids, a mortgage payment, cars to take care of, school to pay for, private school, to, all kinds of things to, to handle, including five pets, five animals. The smallest was a Bichon Frise. The largest was a Lab. Everything in between, including a cat, and I'm allergic to cats. And my life changed radically overnight. Now, in those days, my wife traveled a lot for work, and I realized very quickly that the reason we were married is not because she adored me, but because she needed a free babysitter. <laughs> and, and, and I had been very clear when I went into the, into the wedding and into the marriage. And I had set Prudy's daughters down and said to them, look, you have a dad. I'm not here to replace your dad. That My job, as I see it, is to simply make sure at the end of the day you're still alive. So if there's something required to do that, to make sure you're still alive, then I will try to do that for you. Other than that, you have a mother, you have a father, and basically I'm not involved in any of that. So, and, and, and to make things really challenging at the time, I was going through a really bad time at work. I, I was sent to a new church, Prudy and the girls, it was their first experience of being the pastor's family. We were sent to a new church. They left North Oklahoma City, went to a little tiny rural church. The pastor I followed had had an inappropriate relationship with someone in the church. When he broke it off with her, she waited until the middle of the night, and she came and set the parsonage on fire with him and his family inside. Oh, you tricky lay people, you. Yeah. Nobody was hurt. She went to prison for three years. And not, not that I was counting, three years. And, and, and he was out of the ministry, and then I was supposed to come clean that up. The church was so broke, it would be months, literally months, before I saw a paycheck. And so I have all that weighing down on me. Brudy's gone. I have these two young girls. And one day, one of them comes home from school, and she's just weeping about something some friend said to somebody, and now everybody in school hated her. And so I knew exactly what to do. When somebody in my family had a cold, I ignored it, and eventually it went away. So I thought, if I ignore this, in a day or two, it will go away. Plus, there is this thing, this new invention called the telephone, although at that time, it had a cord and hung on the wall, but, but she could talk to her mom, right, or dad or somebody. But none of that solved the problem. The, the hurt and the tears and the pain did not go away. And about the third day that we were into that, and Prudy's still gone, about the third day we were into that, she announces, I'm never going back to school again. I've, I'm, I'm never going back there again. And I knew I was in real trouble. So I called my uncle. My dad died when I was eight. My uncle was a real father figure to me. Plus, he was Catholic, and he had a huge family. He had kids everywhere and grandkids. And I figured if anybody knew how to handle the situation, it would be him. And he was always supportive and affirming, affirming to me of everything I did. He was very affirming. He was the only person in my family when I, when I said, I, I'm called to go to seminary and become a pastor. He was the only person in my family that said, that's awesome. Everybody else said, oh, my gosh. Oh, you poor thing. He was the guy. So I, I, I called him up, and I told him all the reasons I was not getting involved in Prudy's daughter's life, who was living in my house who I was help, helping to raise. I said, you know, she's, she's got parents. I, I, I don't want to be a disciplinarian. I, I, I don't want to get involved in a way that might do anything bad. I'm just, you know, all the fairy tales, the step-parents are evil, bad. I don't want to be one of those. So I'm just kind of leaving her alone. I'm making sure that at night she has a bed to sleep in and the doors are locked and she's safe. And my uncle got very angry with me. It's the only time in our whole relationship he ever got angry with me. And he said, what are you doing? I said, look, man, I, I got this church. It's weighing down on my shoulders. I'm responsible for this whole church, and it's going bad. This church may not survive because I don't care. He says, you got a young girl living in your house. You're a part of her life, and she deserves your time and your attention. 
And I said, I I don't know what I have to give to her. And my uncle said, give her something. Some of the most important words I ever heard in my life. Give her something. Start somewhere. And it was beautiful what he said. He said, you don't have to solve the whole problem in one moment. But start somewhere. And the way that you start with somebody, and these are the words of a very experienced daddy, he said is, just show her you're on her side. That's it. Don't try to give her advice. Don't tell her how to straighten out her life. Just let her know that you're on her side. So Sunday after I preached, we, we got in my car, and I drove out to Tribby, Oklahoma, beautiful Tribby, you know, vacation spot of the Southwest. And I took her to a farmhouse, old farmhouse, broken down farmhouse. There was a big oak tree growing up through the middle of that house. And we parked in front of it. She said, what are we doing here? I said, well, this is my granddad's house. It's my granddad's farm. And when I feel sad, this is where I go. Because I always feel comforted. You know, my granddad wasn't my dad, but, but, but he was really important in my life. And he always was able to listen. And when I talked to him, I always felt better, and I'd like to be that person in your life. Because she's Prudy's daughter, that's all it took. And then she talked for about another three hours, <laughs> you know. And we got it all out. And we worked through it. She worked through it. Well, I listened. She, she got it all out, and, and she was better. And I remember now, for, for, for over 30 years, I, I think about my uncle's advice. Give her something. You know, there, there are times in life when we feel weighed down, and we look at the burdens that, that, that we're, we're, we feel like we're carrying, and, and, and the hardships, and, and, and we just feel like we can't give any more. And as Christians, we're called to give something, to start somewhere. This week in our nation, we had the opportunity to turn this country around. If Donald Trump had had come out of of the impeachment hearings and and been a little bit kind and and a little bit humble, and and if Nancy Pelosi had, had offered something of an olive branch, if the two of them had offered each other signs of reconciliation, it would have turned this nation around in a few days. But instead, the the image is Nancy Pelosi tearing up his speech at the State of the Union address. The image is Donald Trump at the prayer breakfast tearing his opponents to shreds. And this country is more polarized than it ever was before. It was an opportunity missed. There are times when things are tough, when things are hard, that we have to stand up and start somewhere by giving something. That's what Jesus says in the scripture today. This incredibly powerful story that is so important, it's told in all four gospels, the only miracle that's recorded in all four gospels. You may may need a little refreshing on on what sets it up. What sets it up is another banquet, another meal. You remember John the Baptist and Jesus are close. They're relatives, they're friends, they're connected spiritually. And John the Baptist has been preaching in the desert across from Jericho where the Jordan Ford is there. And and, and people have been coming, thousands of people, to have been coming out and hearing John's messages, and they feel like, God, this guy's like the prophet Elijah. His words are so powerful. And their lives have been changed and transformed. And in the process, he calls out Herod. Herod is the tetriarch. We call him a king, but, but really he, he ruled over a third of what we know as Israel. He was a tetriarch, sort of like a governor, a regional governor. And he calls out Herod because Herod had taken his sister as his wife. And the Jewish laws of that time, that was a big no-no. So John had called out Herod to change his life. And Herod's wife didn't like it. And so she had her husband arrest John the Baptist. Now, Herod liked John the Baptist. He saw him as a holy man. In fact, he sort of thought, maybe this is Elijah come back from the dead. I don't want to mess with this guy. It reminds me very much of when John Wesley was a preacher, and he was just starting to preach. 
And in those days, you never challenged the royalty. But at Oxford, in one sermon, he preached, with two princes, sons of King George, were sitting there in Oxford, and he preached to them that you're sinners just like everybody else. And everybody was, oh, can, can John Wesley said that to the king's sons? The king was delighted. He'd been wanting to say it himself forever. You know? It's kind of what John the Baptist does and kind of the way Herod responds. But Herod's wife, she holds a grudge. And so for Herod's birthday, they have a big drunken party and all the elite are there. Think about the, the Academy Awards, that red carpet scene, you know, where all the fancy people are going in their fancy clothes. It's one of those moments. And, and in the banquet, celebrating his birthday, his wife's daughter begins to dance. And he's enraptured with her. And everybody thinks she's incredible, she's amazing. And so in a drunken stupor, he says to her, I, I love your dancing so much, I will give you anything up to half of my kingdom. And she tiptoes over to her mama and says, Mama, what should I ask for? And she whispers something in her daughter's ear, and her daughter comes back, standing in front of all the dignitaries, she says, I want the head of John the Baptist. Here it is shattered. But a king cannot break his oath. So he calls the captain of the guard and he goes down in the dungeon and he cuts off John the Baptist's head and brings it back on a silver platter for this young girl. Now in our story that, that Robert was reading, Jesus has received that news. And it's a, it's a stark reminder of what happens to people in that culture that try to change and transform things. Maybe that's why when, when things are hard, we sort of withdraw into our shell and, and we don't want to risk anything. I didn't want to risk getting to know this young girl that had become a part of my family because I was afraid I might get my feelings hurt. There are a million reasons why we, why we look at these situations and, and say, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to give anymore. I've done all I can. Jesus is in that moment. In fact, Mark tells us that he wants to go away to a lonely place to recover. And that's a pattern in the Gospels, particularly in the Gospel of Mark. Je Jesus goes out and he serves and he ministers. And then he's wise enough to know that after he's given all that he has to give, that he needs to retreat and heal spiritually and recover. Now, the disciples have just come back to him. You remember in the early passages of the Gospel of Mark, the disciples are clueless. They just don't seem to get Jesus. But in this case, Jesus has sent them out to the villages there around the northern shore of the Galilee, and they have preached, and they have taught, and they've anointed with oil, and they've healed people. It's a huge victory for them. And now they've come back, they've gathered around the feet of Jesus, and he just wants to be with them. You may know that feeling when you're really hurting and you feel very vulnerable and you just want to be with maybe a couple of close friends or a couple of members of your family to heal. And that's, that's where we are in the story now as Mark presents it. And they get into a boat and, and they think they can outrun the crowd. And, and if, you're, if you know anything about geometry, it doesn't make any sense because they get to go a direct straight line. The crowd has to go all the way around the lake and yet somehow the crowd meets them. And no matter where they go, the crowd is there. And Jesus finally gets out of the boat with his disciples, and there's no comfort. There's no rest. There's no healing. The weight of the world is on his shoulders, and, and, and it's crushing him. Now, four times in the Gospel of Mark, that's once every four chapters, if you're keeping track of this, which you might want to, it says Jesus is overwhelmed with compassion. And this is one of those moments. The others will be healing situations, healing a child, for example. It says Jesus was overwhelmed with compassion. Here he is struggling with the loss of his friend and relative John. And yet he looks at the people and he sees the hurt and the brokenness in their lives. They're coming to him seeking answers, seeking truth, seeking a way to live. They're bringing their children and their loved ones to be healed. They're coming literally by the hundreds. In fact, in the story, Mark will say that, that Jesus fed 5,000 men, which is a way of counting in the old world. That means 5,000 families. A conservative estimate is about 20,000 people were there following him. And Jesus looks at them. And he says something that's very reminiscent of the prophets. 
He looks at the people and he says, they're like sheep without a shepherd. Ezekiel said that. Jeremiah said that. There's a real foundation from the prophets here in what Jesus is saying. In fact, in the prophets, they look at the people and they say, oh, these are people without a shepherd. And then they respond by saying, and God will become their shepherd. And that's what Jesus is saying. God now is here in me. And these people who are without a shepherd, I will be their shepherd. If you know anything about sheep at all, they're vulnerable. If you take a lamb and separate a lamb from the shepherd, from the sheepdog, that lamb is vulnerable. And in, in, in Palestine, in Israel, a lamb would not last very long on its own. It would be killed by robbers or by wild animals. And Jesus sees the people, they're vulnerable like sheep. And he knows that his calling is to be their shepherd. Even though he's feeling the burden of the loss of John. Because not only does that mean that he's lost his, his closest friend and companion, his, 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 his compatriot, his ally, but it, but it also means that, well, Herod got John and now he's coming after you. I mean, Jesus knows what it means. But he sees these people and he knows he's called to be their shepherd. And so as a shepherd, he starts to shepherd them. And it's very interesting what Mark says that means. It means that, that he began to teach them. We might even say he began to disciple them. He began to care about them, to help them, to encourage them, to affirm them, to help them find the right direction in their life. That's what he does immediately. And after a while, it's late, it's time to eat. The disciples who don't like the whole situation come and say, send them away. Let them go back to the towns and the villages. All around that northern area in Galilee, there were little fishing villages. Let them go back to the villages and, and, and find food and a place to rest for the night. And Jesus says, no, you feed them. And the disciples look at him and they say, what do you mean? There's hundreds, thousands of people here. We don't have the money to feed all of these people. God help the church when the cost is more important to us than the ministry itself. When, when we worry more about the cost than the impact, we are lost as a church. Disciples are saying, no, no, we, we checked. We, we, you know, we can't do this. And Jesus says those powerful words. Give them something. Do you have a relationship, a friend who's in trouble and you feel like you've dealt with them as long as you could, you've given them your best, give them something. Do you know someone in your life who, who, whose life is, it, it, it always seems to be in trouble and, and you've done all you can and you feel like you've reached your limit, give them something. Is there someone you've noticed? You, you don't know them personally. You don't know their name, but you, know, you see them at the restaurant you always go to or at the cleaners, the laundry, or the ball game. And you always see them, and you know they need help. But you say to yourself, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get involved in somebody else's life. Give them something. Jesus says to his disciples, give them something. And then Jesus changes math. Now, I have a degree in statistics, so I can usually add two and two and get four at least half the time, right? Jesus changes the math. The disciples can do the numbers. They know they have a little bit of bread and a few fish. They know that's not enough to feed everybody, but Jesus changes the math. Give them something, and there will be enough. That's an amazing concept. That's the economics of Scripture. That's the economy of Jesus' kingdom. Don't count what you don't have. Don't make a list of the resources you lack. Find some place to start and give them something. Robert said the Methodist men fed 500 people this year, right? Some of those people had a great, great meal, maybe some wonderful leftovers last for a few days, and then they got maybe to Monday or Tuesday, and they were facing problems again. It'd be real easy for the Methodist men to say, okay, well, you know, they're gonna, no matter what we do, they're going to have problems. Give them something. People walk into this church the last Saturday of every month, 
the neighborhood breakfast for Saturday. They walk in, and, and, and it's easy to look at some of those folks and say, no matter how much we feed you, two days from now, you're going to be hungry again. Give them something. Finally, the disciples trust Jesus, or at least they go through the motions of trusting him, which is what a lot of us in the church do. They go through the motions, they feed the people. It says they sit down in groups of 50 and 100. My mama had 12 older brothers and sisters. They all had lots of kids. When we had a family meal, we had to borrow chairs and tables from other states. You know, I know what a big family meal looks like, right? But it was nothing. What I've experienced is nothing compared to this. Fifties and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people. And Jesus takes the money out of his, and the food out of his lunchbox, and somehow everyone is fed. In fact, Mark tells us that at the end of the meal, everybody had had so much they couldn't eat anymore. I've had meals like that. Have you? Yeah, right? And that they began to gather up the leftovers, and there were 12 baskets full. 12 is always an important number in this culture. It represents 12 tribes, and it means that everyone will be fed by Jesus. Everyone. In fact, the miracle is reminiscent of what happens in the story of Elijah in 2 Kings. In 2 Kings, Elijah needs to feed 100 men. He doesn't have the, the food to feed more than a couple. A pagan, non-believer, comes to Elisha and brings the first fruits of his crop. He says, Elisha, I'm seeking your God, so I brought you this gift. Use it any way you want to. And suddenly Elisha is able to feed everyone because of the gift of someone who is outside of his religion. Jesus gathering everyone together on this hillside, saying that the kingdom of God is offered to everyone and everyone is to be fed. And cared for. That's why in Methodists we, we, we have that table at communion that everybody can come to. Because Jesus brought everybody. The more we focus on that, the better off we are as a denomination. Give them something. Wherever the vulnerability is in your life, wherever you see brokenness, hurt, and need, Give them something. Start somewhere. Take that first step. Today on the altar, there's a, a carnation for a lady named Sandy. Some of you know her. Most of you met her. May, you may not have known her name. She lived on the streets of Lawton. She died on the streets of Lawton. Just a few hundred feet from our church out on the street one night, probably froze to death. She lived on the street. She lived a life that's very different than most of us. There won't be a funeral for her. There's no family, it seems, to contact. But we remember Sandy. Sandy was precious to us. When she had moments of, of clarity... She attended Bible studies here on Wednesday morning with the ladies or went to Sunday school. She came and worshiped in this room with us. If you were ever at a church meal, she was probably there. She was really good at hide and seek. I think she's the centenary champion at hide and seek because sometimes she would hide in the building and we wouldn't find her for a long time. We explained the boundaries to her, but she always came back. She came back because we were the only people who knew her name. When her body was found, we were the only ones who knew who she was. We fed her. We gave her a home. We welcomed her as a part of our family. Sandy came back here time and again because we gave her something. This is the word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.